McClellan took us to the beach at Grand Isle, the same one President Obama visited a week earlier. Every day they come and clean the oil up, and then every day more washes in, and uh, then they have to start all over again. Oh, look at the size of this. Oh, you, look, you can see this. This goes up under the sand, too. This giant chunk. This is totally solid. All the way through. Oil clogging the beaches, business on the island is suffering. Fire Chief Aubrey Shasson fears for his town. And that's pretty scary business as a concern. Yeah, they're making money with the oil field stuff, but that doesn't last forever. What's going to happen when they pick up a lead? What, what is the economy going to be like? I mean, is there going to be room with this? Is there going to be, you know, is people going to want to come here? The uncertainty and frustration are evident as McClellan drives through town. Another source of frustration, access to the story is sometimes controlled by BP. Journalists like McClellan have encountered roadblocks in their reporting. She ran up against one when she wanted to take us to Elmer's Island, a wildlife sanctuary just west of Grand Isle. We're coming up onto the turnoff for Elmer's Island right now. This is the only road onto the wildlife refuge. These grim pictures were taken two weeks ago when McClellan first reported from the area. There's a bunch of sheriff's cars. This time, a gatekeeper is waiting. Each closed. solution 
way of making the oil go to a different place. I think that BP has done this so we can't see it because they have tried to minimize how much oil is coming. They didn't want other people to look at it and report on it. They're just hiding the body. Out of sight, out of mind. It's out of sight, out of mind. It's a PR ploy. It's a trick. Do you, do you believe the government also wants to keep it out of sight, out of mind, or that it's mostly a BP, or is it both? I think initially there were people in the government who thought we should just dissolve some of this oil and then that, uh, you know, they're going to cap it in a couple of days. We'll try to keep it from getting to shore. We'll sacrifice some of the water quality for a while, and it'll be okay. But things have changed. We're not talking about just hitting a spill. We're talking about millions of gallons. What's the long-term effects, in your view, on ocean life in the Gulf? There is uh, almost certainly a very wide die-off of fish eggs, fish larvae, and plankton communities. We also know that turtles eat oil. They just have a tendency to ingest these soft blobs because they eat jellyfish usually, and it kills them. We also know it kills dolphins and whales because when the Exxon Valdez ran aground, it killed about 40% uh, of the killer whales there or so. That population has not recovered in the last 20 years. So we know that it kills things acutely in the moment of the event, and we know that the long-term effects can really linger for, for decades, not just months or years, but for decades. Can you talk about the effect on other kinds of animals? The Gulf is more important biologically than a similar area in many other parts of the ocean because there are a lot of animals that live out in the open ocean that go into the Gulf to breed. One of them is the Kemp's Ridley sea turtle, which is the most endangered sea turtle in the world. It only breeds in the Gulf. Another is the uh, giant Atlantic bluefin tuna. There are also millions of migratory birds that come across the Gulf and that, uh, and that winter in the Gulf and then leave to go north. To the extent that those birds are dying there, that will reduce populations of nesting birds as far away as the Arctic and even across to Greenland. You wrote a book called The Seafood Lover's Almanac. Could talk about the effect on seafood coming out of the Gulf in the past six weeks. Well, the government has closed a lot of the Gulf to fishing, so uh, there is no seafood coming out of much of the Gulf, and I think that that is going to spread because they keep extending the closed area. They uh, clearly don't want contaminated seafood in the U.S. seafood supply because the government doesn't want the liability. They don't want to freak people out that, that will refuse to buy any shrimp or any oysters or any crabs, regardless of where it comes from. But the thing is that they jumped right on the fishing industry. They closed it immediately. They wanted to stop a problem from spreading, and they should have done that with the oil itself, and they didn't. Characterize this. Is this a Katrina-like event? What are, what are the analogies from history that you think of? Well, I, in talking to people in the Gulf, they say that this is going to make Katrina look like a bad day. That Katrina came and went. This is not going away. So I think that rather than this being something like Katrina, I think it's more like Big Oil's Chernobyl. I think it's a catastrophe that shows the enormous risks that this industry poses to public well-being, public health, the health of communities, the economy, and the people who depend on all of that. Who do you blame for this bill? Is it BP? Is it lax regulation? And what can we do to try to make sure this doesn't happen again? BP has been very irresponsible because they didn't want to spend more money on a better backup system. They didn't have backup plans. On the other hand, we have a government whose job is supposed to be to insulate our interests, the public interest and the interests of the future uh, and the country from the narrow interests of a few people. And the, the entire culture of deregulation, the whole thing about we have to be very close with the regulators and the regulated, has created a mindset where we don't understand that there's a difference between a private company's of interest in profits and the rest of the public estate, not just now.